Our conversation is my proof of God's existence. There you go, Ryan. This conversation is my proof. Who are you? Who am I? How did we connect? This is a great conversation. Where did this come from? What did we do to deserve this? Great to meet you, uh, Barbara Brown <laughs> Taylor. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for giving me this time. It's an honor to speak with you. Um, as I had mentioned, sort of when I when I reached out, I'm sort of in this space where I'm sort of trying to speak to people who have very engaged spiritual lives and have a lot to say and think about the kind of things that are really sort of inspiring me. So I'm I'm very grateful to be speaking with you. Thank you so much for this time. No, oh, thanks for asking me, Ryan. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. Um, just wanted to start as a place that I think would be a great place where we could flow this conversation from. And that's sort of about spiritual identity, uh, which really fascinates me. You know, you've been sort of fluid. You've been through a lot of changes in your life. You've seen so much. You've experienced so much. You even called yourself sort of a spiritual contrarian in the past. So I'm wondering today, you know, how you would define your spirituality. I like you giving me permission to define it today, because today is about all I can keep track of. It's true that I guess a gift of long life is, is uh, I like fluid. Fluid suits me fine, a fluid identity. So, you know, we haven't got time to do the generations, but I was trying to think of how to phrase them in terms of Iron Age and Ice Age and, you know, all those ages we go through. But, but I was a teenage seeker you know, not, not raised in churches. So adolescent rebellion took the form of seeking God and being discouraged by my parents from doing that. And uh, so I went to church with a lot of people and was um, baptized in the Baptist church by immersion and then found out there were other kinds of Christian churches. Then I went into an interdenominational phase and then I went to seminary and realized if I wanted any future in the church, I needed to pick a flavor. I needed to pick a denomination. So that a long time ago, that would not be necessary now. So I, I found the Episcopal Church after a lot of wandering and found it a great place for me because it had a broad theological way. There was a book of common prayer in the pew, not a book of common belief or common confession or you know, this is where we stake out our turf. So I've been happy in that tradition for a long time. Though when I left parish ministry for college teaching, there was a big shift, and we can talk about that later. But I went out of the answer business and into the question business, and it was a great shift for me. So oh, I love that. These gonna, days, I, you know, yeah. And when I look it up on, on Wikipedia, I'm a pantheist. Who knew? Maybe they say I'm well, a pantheist, but I don't know. So, well, see, I'm excited to talk about that because I think you're in a very brave and exciting space, and and I love the way that you allow that fluidity to exist in your life. But I was thinking in, in our, a couple of email exchanges we had before this, you mentioned mainline Christianity. And yeah. I grew up in the evangelical Pentecostal church. Yeah. And yesterday I Googled what is mainline Christianity, A. And I also think or pretend that I know a lot about Christianity or spirituality. A, does that surprise you? And mm -hmm. B, sort of, why do you think I had to Google that, you know? Oh, well, because these days, those of us in mainline denominations are used to it being called sidelined because it's gone. You know, it's tiny now. I mean, I think there are some denominations hanging on to numbers, and I don't think numbers are a definition of faithfulness or even influence. But the numbers, you know, are certainly showing big, big decline and big, big gains in community churches um, that claim to be non-denominational, but the minute I read their statement of belief, I know whether they're disgruntled Methodists or disgruntled Presbyterians. So I can usually find the worldview um, that way, but um, mega churches that don't identify denominationally. So the mainline days are gone. It's it's a, a, a small group, um, and I don't think that's gonna be bad, but it's got history. It, it claims a history. And so we know where people in our, labor fell off cliffs you know where they got it wrong and and who the heroes are and who the scoundrels are and i don't find that in a local church 
that is based on the personality of a pastor. If that's not, a, that might be unfair, but there are ways in which there's almost a dynasty in pastoral leadership of some mega churches where I live. It sort of goes father to son, you know, or father to the recipient and doesn't work that way in mainline churches. It's um, just a different way of identifying, but I've met tons of people who identify as post evangelical. I haven't heard post Pentecostal yet, um, but yeah, I'll say so. it for the first time. <laughs> um, but that's that schism to me is fascinating that there could be this whole history and this whole tradition and these whole practices, mm-hmm. you know, inspired by the teachings of Jesus Christ, and then this whole other thing. And even to this day in the internet age, and you know, what do you think is sort of at, at the root of maintaining that distance, or why do you think that schism hasn't sort of intertwined? You know, when I've it's that it's a great question because I think I told you as soon as I got into the classroom, I would mention well-known theologians and preachers, and students had never heard of them. And when I explored the theologians and preachers they knew about, I'd never heard of them. So we were on very parallel tracks. In the U.S., that sometimes gets um, sorted out by what um, channels you subscribe to or what publications you read so that Christianity today is pretty famously associated with um, more conservative Christianity and the Christian century is associated with more, I don't even know what to call it. I hate all the words progressive. Does that make everybody else regressive? Mm. You know, are emerging, which makes everybody else submerged. I don't, I don't like any of the names, but at least for a, a way of being Christian that Uh, allows human presence in the reading of scripture, in the understanding of Jesus, and and admits happily that there's all kinds of human subjectivity around that. I don't find that as much in more conservative Christianity, which says, no, it's a concrete, inarguable thing. It's not a subjective thing. So you're drawing me out on things you haven't thought adequately about, but there's a big difference in the way we see the world. To, to be to, so this this leads into my next question perfectly. It's a blunt question, and I don't think you're afraid to answer this question or think it's a strange question, but it feels important for me to ask. But mainline Christianity, your tradition, is that the only way to know God? Is that the only way to find God? No, I think most people in mainline would do this. No, no, you know, because we've been around again since the Reformation, most Protestant denominations, you know, long enough to watch our own denominations split and fight and argue about things and decide on some mm-hmm. things and watch the mass exodus. So, no, it's not the only way. Within our own denominations, we've got all kinds of factions that think differently. So, if it's happening at home, of course, it's happening elsewhere. But I like to view that as the blessing of diversity, you know, the blessing of different views. I, I love to think of the experience of the divine as a diamond with as many facets as you can get on a rough rock. And and it wouldn't sparkle mm. without the facets. I mean, I put on the brakes with some things, um, you know, around women's leadership or uh, domestic arrangements of who's in charge and who's the follower and who's the leader. You can get me you know, to some facets, I'd like to put a little magic marker on and just kind of cut that one out. But all in all, it seems uh, much healthier for me to admit that I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the only way to God. How many people would I have to excommunicate if I said I knew the only way? That's just, no. How problematic when you think about people that hold that view how problematic is it to hold that view? Can you hold that view and really be in tune with this sort of spirituality that has sort of inspired you to even want to talk about this stuff? And I don't mean to say it to condemn people, to judge people, but to hold on to that seems to be one of the most cor- corrosive things we've ever done in terms of trying to understand God or be good people. Well, now I'm the journalist. You said to hold on to that. Tell me what that is. To hold on to that, to hold on to that exclusive truth that that maintains tribalism, that maintains nationalism, that maintains othering. Othering to me and tribalism is is sort of the, the the greatest cancer facing humanity right now. To me, that's tribalism. So can you be tribal mm-hmm. and still, you know, is that the corrosive force that must end that just the claiming of any exclusivity in any religion, Christianity and beyond? 
Oh, first of all, nothing I say will keep anybody from claiming exclusivity. So we're in no danger. But when I look at the fruits of tribalism, that's really all I've got to look at is the fruits. If we call it community with boundaries, I see beauty in that. I've spent some time at Brigham Young University lately. I didn't know much about Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And now I know a little more that that's a community with clear boundaries, you know, and and it's been persecuted for boundaries. I had a Mennonite um, house guest over the weekend and you know, Mennonites have moved from country to country because they don't swear fealty to state government. And so they move a lot. I mean, I, I know boundary communities that don't, that produce good fruit. Uh, but when I look at what you and I are thinking of when we think of tribalism, which is excluding, like anybody not within this boundary is going to hell. Uh, the fruits of that aren't lovely to me. They aren't nourishing to me. I don't want to go there. I'd rather be a pantheist and you you hit on the thing and i think that's why i used to discern things these days and this i'm this is a very biblical thing like what are the fruits like it's so obvious right it's interesting mm -hmm. because you say i like the idea of the restricting like you closed community maybe you didn't use the word closed but restricted sort of like thing and i've mentioned too like i'm a big richard Rohr guy and you know i'll just get that out there um <laughs> but just that idea of that he talks about and you're familiar with it it's like there's your tradition which is important but if you mm -hmm. don't include experience mm -hmm. into that you're totally lost and to me that's what it is it's tradition without being open to the experiences of reality mm -hmm. do, do you kind of sort of see that as sort of part of it it's like keep your tradition but if you're not evolving yeah. here with the mm -hmm. world if you're not evolving with an ever-expanding universe you're missing the point here you're missing the boat on something maybe richer Mm -hmm. Sure. And since we've evoked um, the the blessed brother, Richard Rohr, uh, his great analogy that, you know, we're all we're all fingers pointing at the moon. I mean, all of our traditions, all of the things we hold dear, our ways of understanding God and our place in the world, we're, it's their fingers pointing to the moon. And we keep arguing about who has the best finger. I love that analogy. You know, like who do we think yeah. we are? The moon is the moon. Our fingers are our fingers, but, you know, experience, we can talk about what it was like to teach world religions and go into um, places of worship and study from the world's great religions and to just be brought to my knees by the kindness, the hospitality, the welcome, because a group from the dominant U.S. tradition came to visit, you know, a tiny um, part of the U.S. expression of religion. And that experience changed me for good. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of yeah. how many of these outsiders have been my best fingers pointing to the moon. Yeah, it's a brilliant transition because um, you're teaching experience, your book, Holy Envy, very influential book. Part of the main reason that I saw that you had written that book when I was learning about you and I was like, this experience is enough for me to know I will enjoy speaking to this person. <laughs> but it also reminded me of a concept and I assumed it would make sense to you. And then I saw you appeared on Brian McLaren's podcast with the exact title that this is include and transcend. Yeah, you don't transcend, which is a broad word, but include. And to me, I heard that as, for me, that's about the more I include other ideas about God and and with with good discernment, I transcend to this yeah. openness and this ability to let go of my mm -hmm. own ego and my own exclusive claims. How mm -hmm. does that concept potentially ring true with how teaching world religions changed you? Oh, wait a minute. I got so interested in what you said. This is a break. This is an edit point. Can you go okay. back and just do I mean, I listened and I went three different ways. So okay. rewind. Give me that one more time. For me, so you were teaching world religions. And for me, and I'm curious how that changed you, because for me, so Muslim friends in my life, thinking about Buddhism, meditating in ways that I thought I never knew how to do. Yeah, actually, I'll edit it because I get like so emotional about it. Like it's crazy. It's like we'll find we'll find some good pieces in here. In uh, <laughs> when I include when I when I meditate on the idea of including, I've transcended, and I want to ask you about transcendent experience. But it's like that gives me the the confidence and authority yeah. to say those things that there's yeah. all ways to God. So I will I will tidy this up. 
But so oh, from, don't it's so dear from from your experience. Yeah, and I can edit the original question where this didn't happen, but it's like, how did including help you transcend, and how much of it was studying these other religions with a pure heart? Yeah, sorry. Oh, please. I'm so touched by your being touched because I I just told you visiting these places brought me to my knees, right? Yeah, and that's why I knew you were you were we were talking I'm about I'm not in it thing. right this second, but but there there are there are a lot of things going on there. One is I have often heard Christianity is the way that is open to all ways. That to read you know, the Gospels, the New Testament, with one set of ears is to see someone for whom neighbor was more important category than religion. And over and over again, neighbor, even when the neighbor was a stranger, an irritating stranger, you know, a, a, a heathenish stranger, that over and over again, the stranger, the neighbor is granted priority over firm grasp of a tradition and obedience to it. So it, again, I read the text in my own way but but i have when i meet a stranger and can see the human being there we're on our way to a conversation that can transcend politics and it can transcend religion and gender it can transcend a whole lot of things once we both see the human being uh, i think it was gandhi's grandson who said um, what we have most in common is not our religion, but our humanity. And I know that can sound glib, but to be with someone in pain, to be someone in joy, to see someone holding a baby at a kind of initiation ceremony I have never been part of is, is to transcend religion. That's not the most important thing in the room. The most important thing in the room is I've been invited into this intimate circle, you know, to speak of things that matter. So I, I, the last thing I'll say is I remember coming up behind someone in the little church I served, and he was so irritated uh, by the ways in which he was learning all about the Episcopal tradition. He said, I expect my tradition to lead me beyond my tradition and to equip me to be with people beyond my tradition. Why does it keep wanting to keep me at home? And I thought that was the best comment, you know, from somebody in church every Sunday who, who said he wanted his faith to lead him into a larger world of faith and equip him to be there as a good, a good neighbor. And I think you're sort of, you're hitting home on the point that as much as you transcend it, you hold dear to the heart of your tradition and you're able to keep that open mind. Were there any experiences that jump out to you during those, those years where you clearly would have had some epiphanies that really jumped out to you that you felt really started to shift your thinking as you started to, include oh i if you read holy envy you know this one but um 9 11 2001 my class was scheduled to go to um masjid in atlanta a mosque and i can't believe now that 9 11 happened on a tuesday and we were scheduled to go to the mosque for friday prayer so what was that two or three days if i'd asked for permission to go on that field trip a year ago, you know, or in 2010, I'd never have been given permission, but we were. So a lot of people bailed out. A lot of people went. Um, it was a small, not affluent mosque, which meant women were in the same room as men. We sat at the back, men sat at the front. But I heard my first sermon about 9-11 from an imam in a mosque. And it was about what you and I are talking about. It was about... Um, the need for unity of humankind and he even called members of his own tradition to great account that day you know about what made a muslim and what didn't but what i remember most of all is after the sermon was over how um the women back where i was grabbed the other women and kissed us and and said thank you for coming to see for yourself who we are instead of just watching the news and that i'll never forget all the arms all the arms that reached out to hug us and we were dragged into bosoms and kissed by people with beautiful perfume on so that one that was one that brought me to my knees and among many among many others i cannot think of a single site visit that went sour. People were so kind to us. One, one place we went to a Sikh Gurdwara, people had been there for two hours cooking lunch for us. People, just a bunch of noisy students 
who didn't even know where we were or what we were doing. They'd been there two hours cooking lunch for us. So there's a fruit. Absolutely. And in a more expanding upon that idea of sort of these experience, I'm kind of, you know, been reading more about and understanding the the mystical side of the Christian tradition, the Thomas Merton's roar, I think is in that lineage. James Finley is someone you might be familiar with that I interviewed. Would mm-hmm. the experience you just described, would you, would you call that a mystical experience? <laughs> did it, did it, did it affect you in a way that isn't just, oh, this is interesting. How did, was it mystical? Or would you use that kind of language even to talk about it? Oh, I love, it's a huge word. See, we'd have to talk about what do we mean when we oh, say mysticism okay. and then we'll talk okay. about what we mean when we say God. Okay. okay. But for oh, me, myst- yeah. a mystical experience is one where boundaries get blurred, whether it's, um, I can have a mystical totally. experience where skin is the boundary that gets blurred, where me and a tree are having a conversation and it doesn't involve words, but wherever boundaries are blurred, um, wherever distinctions are less clear than then it's a unitive experience, Ryan. A mystical experience for me is unitive. So if it if it unifies me with whatever's going on around me instead of dividing me from it, that's mystical enough for me. So so sure it was. It was firing though in my senses as well. So if mysticism is not also sensual or sensory, then I don't know if I know anything about it because I tingle. I mean, I frankly by this definition you may have to cut this out but lady gaga singing at the academy awards was a mystical experience (laughs) when that woman took all her makeup off and all her fancy clothes off and sang from the top of that tiny little head down to her feet i just got a rush from head to foot okay so we're we're speaking the same language and and this is exciting and it's like there's i have one of my, my best friend is visiting me now here in london and we can have an amazing conversation and i can feel like this is beautiful right but yep and, and if you don't want to talk about it, I, and, or it's too private, but it's like, have you ever had an experience where it was just like, boom, and you disappear somewhere for a little bit? Like, obviously, you're very aware you're in your room or wherever you are, you're walking in the garden, but it is like the difference between a little tingle and like, yeah. you're not in yeah. control anymore. Yeah. Have you ever experienced that? We won't talk about drugs, right? We'll just leave that off the table. That was a long time ago now. No, I'm I would let it feel you. free. No, I don't want to, I don't want to um, minimize what you're talking about because yes, but it will be different from you because we're so temperamentally, I mean, people are so temperamentally different, which is another oh, problem with yeah, one, yeah, way, yeah. one way for one person. What happened to all of our differences? But, but the way I experience what you're talking about most is in what's sometimes called flow. And for me, it comes mm. right a lot. W R I T I N G, um, that I can lose five hours. I can go so far in to that experience. I lose time. I lose place. And when I come out, I'm just in coate. I mean, I can't talk to people for a while. I, you know, the worst thing I can do is go to the grocery store because I can't choose cereal in, after a state like that. So, so that's as close as I've come. And it happens in the world. It happens. I live on 165 acres in the middle of nowhere. So it happens for me with a day at a particular day, but it's brief for me. And it sounds like you've had experiences that lasted longer. Yeah, not extra, extra long. And I think the way you, I I love the way that you just responded to that. And that's why I love conversation, obviously, is that it's (laughs) like the way you experience that good, just be careful not to pretend like you want it to hear that everyone else has had something that you can identify with, but what you just described is beautiful. The flow state tapping mm-hmm. into those, your gifts. And I, I feel like that probably affirms that you're, there's something special about when you write. And I want to mm-hmm. get into some of, of how you felt called to do that in a minute, but uh, I can totally relate with that. And I thought that was a beautiful way to describe it. Um, mm-hmm. Shifting gears a little bit. Um, I'm curious too, like Jesus Christ as, as a figure, where are you at on the person of Jesus Christ. He's, who is Jesus Christ to you? Well, if I turned this computer around, you'd see an icon behind the computer, fourth century from um, a monastery in the Sinai. But I went on sabbatical in 1990 and spent three months trying to answer that question. And and as close as I got was walking into the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, where I got in a fight with a guide because I looked around at where the altar used to be. And I said, this place wants to be a church. And he said, no, madam, this place wants to be a mosque. 
And I thought, okay, there. let's just go look at the art. So I, I found a mosaic I had studied in school and I just wept. I just stood in front of it and wept for a while. And that was the answer of three months of searching was tears. You know, tears in one of the oldest places on earth, looking at a mosaic somebody had scraped junk off of to reveal Jesus with his mother on one side and John the Baptist on the other. Maybe I've got that mixed up. I just remember the gold. I just remember the gold mosaic and the tears. So finally, somebody found me, thank goodness, and reunited me with my group. But that was my answer. So if I made myself put words on it, um, I would come to the same conclusion as a lot of people who've done Jesus studies, that in the end, he's he's a, a figure walking into the mist, you know, uh, and, and the minute I have him figured out, that's done. Who in the world would want to figure, figure out who he was? You know, was he a failed revolutionary? Uh, w- was he a, a divine creature walking around on earth, in which case I want to see the DNA? You know, but, but but when I try to go down all the my scientific paths and theological paths, I just end up with the mystery of someone who I'm still wondering about. What's that? I'm still wondering about him. So that's beautiful. And that, again, to quote uh, Richard Rohr in one lecture that he gave that I listened to, and he may have been paraphrasing other people, and I'll paraphrase him here. You know, of course, we talk about the only way to talk about God and understand God is through metaphor. and perhaps the same, which sounds so heretical to my Pentecostal brain, but it's like, perhaps that is the only way we should ever think about Jesus Christ. And in fact, it doesn't matter if he actually existed. It doesn't (laughs) matter if he actually died and rose again, because the metaphor of what that means Uh for our own lives is the good news. And that's exciting. Uh So who cares? Stop debating about whether he existed or whether he rose, where's the grave? Does Uh that ring true to you? Or do you think that goes a little too far to be like, Jesus Christ is is a metaphor. That's the best way to think about it. Yes, he might have existed, but just if you stay in metaphor, that's the healthiest place to be. You know, Nikos Kazantzakis, The Last Temptation of Christ, I think it's that book where it turns out Jesus was not crucified. He made it out alive. He went and married Mary and had children or something. And later someone found out about that and was going to expose it. And I, I don't remember it clearly, but the point was, go ahead and expose it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter now, you know, because because the story has taken off and the story is so rich with meaning. I choose to believe somebody walked around to have that kind of impact, though I taught religion. So they're like two historical references to his real being. And the truth is nothing caught on until the movement caught on. In other words, he was not a big splash. John the Baptist gets more attention in some of the historical annals of the time. So um, so. I'm at least completely on board with metaphor. And I really want to talk to people who don't pay attention to how Jesus uses metaphor incessantly. At one point he's talking about, did you bring bread? And somebody says, Oh no, we forgot the sandwiches. He said, I'm not talking about bread, bread. I'm talking metaphorically here. I wish he had said that out loud, but he worked through metaphor. And every time someone asked him for a definitive answer, he'd say, well, you know, the answer to that, or he'd say, let me tell you a story. Or he'd say, what do you think? I mean, where do people get off thinking? I it, it must be a second or third generation thing that we're supposed to be certain about someone mm. who so upset people's certainties. Right. And again, a big question, but from your reading of the Bible, obviously the Bible is a book that you've read a lot and you've studied, of course, over the years. It's it's kind of the the question that seems sort of settled to me from my reading. Of course, that's a very strong thing to say that Jesus didn't want to be worshipped like it was never going to be about him and he would if he existed which he probably did i'm not trying to argue he didn't exist and he could come (laughs) back today and be like why are you worshiping me which again for the pentecostal evangelical way is like whoa that's that's heresy that's the devil toying with your head a little bit but from what's your reading say about that oh that one's easy because i had to answer that for myself and i i started at the beginning all i had was the four gospels and now we know there are a bunch more they're like 19 more gospels that were in circulation in the first couple centuries of the church but the four 
you know, that made it into the text. A, I love it. They don't all agree. And the early church thought we could handle that. Yeah, let's go ahead and put in some things that don't match up. They can handle this. You know, plus these are the authoritative accounts and they don't match. Now, I know people who harmonize them, but I went back to the beginning of every gospel. And, you know, Mark and John don't even start with a birth narrative. And Matthew and Luke do, but Jesus comes proclaiming the, the kingdom of God. He doesn't come proclaiming himself. You know, and in Mark's gospel, you've got, why do you call me good? No one's good, but God alone. Who's that? You know, who's who doesn't ask to be worshipped, who, if anything, when people are following him, goes and finds a boat so he can push out into the water and get a little distance on all that. Now, they're hungry. I don't know that they're there to worship. They're there to eat and be healed. And that seems to be what he is about, is signaling something. I think it's nearness of kingdom you know, in, in what happens when hungry people seek food and hurt people seek healing and need their friends to lower them down through roofs. And, um, you got me, you got me going here. I'm a Bible geek, which is really odd for somebody who reads the Bible like I do, but I love the book and I'm convinced Jesus did not come to be worshiped. I love it. The definitive, like, there it is. There, Thank you. For I said that. it. I appreciate that's And that's courage. And I honestly, that is courage, even though maybe you said that a thousand times, but <laughs> and I think that's that's my reading of it. And the people that that inspire me um, will, will say that it's it's interesting, right? Because it leads to two things. One, I, before I forget, on the Bible, right? I read, you know, this interesting quote you gave, which was just sort of, you've sort of internalized, maybe it was in a, in a video interview as well. You've internalized Christianity in some way that you don't need to be, oh, I need to read this book and that book and that book. You've sort of like soaked it in. Where does the Bible stand in that in terms of not needing to read other books? What's your relationship with the Bible like today? Oh, that, I mean, what a book, what it's a library is what it is. And, and it contains arguments, which I just adore that Ecclesiastes argues with Proverbs and John's gospel argues with Mark's gospel. And Paul argues with, you know, the writer of the book of Acts. So I love the book for all kinds of reasons. It contains arguments. It contains, um, it contains in almost every book, an insistence on caring for those who don't belong to the group, you know, and any text that does that, that, that honors those who don't belong to the group whose book this is, has got my attention. So I read, but I, here's, here's how I read the text. And I read it as the human recording of the experience of God. I read it as the, the human record of seeking God, of the hunger for holiness, you know, of how people experienced the divine from the beginning, at least the, not the beginning of time. I don't read Genesis that way. Um, but then I can read it and just dive into all the ways we human beings have experienced and written about God. And I can find parts. I won't like Thomas Jefferson cut them out, but I wish they weren't there. And I'd sure never give a Bible to a fifth grader because I tried that once. And all he wanted to read was all the gruesome murdering cutting off heads part. And, and, and then somebody of course had to find all the very, very um, erotic, you know, parts usually where some prophet is behaving badly and gets compared to a whore in luscious detail or Israel does at any rate, the Bible's a dangerous book. And uh, most people who say they use it as a guidebook for life, I want to say, show me the pages I mean, I'll go with the Sermon on the Mount for that, but there's a lot in the Bible is not my guidebook for life. It, it's interesting too, right? Because in, in studying a little about mainland versus evangelical, it seems like the inerrancy question hasn't really been a big issue in that. I'm sure there's a variety of exceptions. Um, and I wonder from, from your perspective, this whole biblical inerrancy, mm -hmm. how do you discern or how do you decide like to speak truth to that and to speak to those and try to, in my evangelical way of talking, convert them out of that way of thinking or wake them up to that when it is so obviously holding back what Jesus was saying. Mm -hmm. What, and I know we're leaning on our own understanding to speak so authoritatively about this, and we're just two people just shooting the breeze. But how do you hold back from being like, this is a dangerous book. This guy didn't want to be worshiped. What are you doing? Oh, I'm not an evangelist in that realm. And, and I'll tell you why not. I still remember 
a, a number of student faces, but the first one who woke me up, I think I was kind of a, a bull in a China shop in the classroom at first, because I did, I really wanted, you know, to, for people to know history of how scripture was put together and da 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 da. But I, I met a young woman who, who believed scripture, I mean, believed everything that we, that you and I, you know, are, are wondering about. And I found out, you know, she lived in a trailer park with her mom, who'd have several husbands and boyfriends, all of whom had come into this girl's room at some point or another. And Jesus was her lifesaver. I mean, Jesus was her metaphysical, otherworldly, save me from this horror that I, as a young woman, can't do a thing about. And I backed off by a hundred yards and decided never to mess with anybody's views of Jesus ever again, because I hadn't lived their lives and I didn't know what kind of chaos was right underneath their feet. And it seemed hugely important. If I wanted people to honor where I was, I had to honor where they were. Now, if they're going to get murderous and violent toward other people, I want to do something, say something. But I don't know, she and many others after, just the vulnerability of, of where people are and the role that scripture or Jesus play in their lives. That's not my business to go poking at that. It's just not my business. I could do so much harm. Interesting. And you talk about sort of having to resist that and learn. So it, it's sort of been a process to do that. And again, you're leaning on a personal experience to sort of affirm that discernment of why you would keep away with that. It also kind of reminded me just, I was reflecting on um, this conversation I had with James Finley and he talked mm -hmm. about the mystical, but let's just use the word truth. If that's even like, it never imposes itself. So if you want someone to have that kind of transcendent experience, you can't impose it on someone. You can speak your own truth, but you must allow it to be felt by that person, experienced by that person without being imposed. So my question on that is, are you ever slickly trying to be subtle about these things? Because there's a difference between like, why do you believe this Bible is true? Are you stupid? Like versus have you ever thought about this? Or please listen to this lecture by X, Y, and Z. Uh -huh. I'm not saying are you out there trying to convert people, but is there subtle ways, maybe it's what you write about, what you don't write about. Is there a subtle way in which you are trying to open people's mind or get them thinking towards a path of more inclusiveness in these things? Yes. I'm trying to bless curiosity. That's about all. And, and in, uh, see, I'm thinking of two things when you asked me that one is classroom experience, but that's a particular age group for the most part. And for them, I, I did my very best to come up with assignments, paper topics, visits that would simply bless their curiosity about other people and the way other people believe and practice their faith, how they approach God, think about the human place. But I, I tried to set experiments that would allow them to pursue their curiosity about things and then to use religious language that I speak from my heart I left the rest up to the spirit and and whenever in your words you just use whenever I started feeling myself in my self-righteousness in my certainty about things whenever I felt myself starting to impose that the Holy Spirit told me to go sit down <laughs> and um, leave it alone so so it's that's been beautiful. That's the classroom. And then in writing it, it, I can't tell you how many people write and just finally say, I always wondered about that, but I never really had the courage to pursue that curiosity. Or I always thought that. And it, so that seems like my job as a writer is just say things people want to say, but haven't yet. <laughs> <laughs> you said something that's leading me into an idea I want to make sure we get to is you talked about knowing when to sit down and yeah. knowing when to pull back. And I'm I'm fascinated by what clearly seems to be, and I know you've, you've written about these things and it's very complicated, sort of rebuking, strong word, correct me, fame, rebuking people being like, I'm an amazing speaker. I'm the best speaker. I'm the best female this. I'm the best not, just whatever. How, let's start here. How did you know that you had a gift for speaking and what gave you the courage to try it for the first time? Oh gosh, this is such an old story for me. Now I wanted to be a writer. You're looking at a failed poet, a failed short story writer um, mm -hmm. who went to, you know, writer's colonies for months at a time and produced only one short story that I sent to Harper's. And it came back to me saying, it, somehow the the editor's notes had survived at the bottom. It said, this is a really good story, but it makes me want to kill myself. 
I thought, I don't think, I don't think I'm going to be a short story That's... writer. So I, I, you know, I went to seminary. I loved language. I loved the humanities. Theology is the queen of the humanities. Bottom line, somebody invited me to preach one time. A little short homily during Holy Week, seven minutes, dark church. I wasn't ordained yet. And there were maybe 12 people there. But afterwards, somebody came up and said, could I have a copy of that? And I thought, darn. I just sold my first short story. You know, I'd give it away for free, but somebody wanted to read it. And and then I started, you know, from there on, I did seek ordination. And as things came into print, people wanted to read something else. And as people heard a sermon, they wanted to hear another sermon. So it really, the call, whatever it was, came from readers and listeners. And it came at a cost. You know, because then you have to be better than you were last time. You have to be better than the other people who are good at this. And it's like pretty soon you're being declared the winner of a horse race you never entered. And it becomes impossibly competitive, you know, especially for somebody with it, you know, I mean, ego and and a, a, I'm an A plus eldest child, you know, so I want to be the best at whatever I do. I want to get a good grade. So all of that means that I, I now think I flee competency. If I ever become good at something, I just stop. I just quit and go do something I don't know how to do so that I can start over and, uh, and be, anyway, I'm, I'm so happy. Progressive. I'm, I'm what? You're a progressive, progressive <laughs> Christian. Oh but, yeah. But when it, what does it, again, I think everyone dreams of being, and it's the ego speaking, right? Applauded for something, celebrated for something, what did it feel like to start to be like, oh, this is happening to me. This is what only happens to in the public. I get everyone has their own specialness and I agree with that, but there is a uniqueness to, you might call it fame. You might call it just recognition above what, what did that feel like to enter into that space? Was it kind of surreal? How did you process it? You know, I almost remember the weekend that happened Baylor university um sponsored a survey of you know best preachers in the english speaking world don't you love that and and the, and they found out the first year they couldn't do that cuz nobody agreed on what made a sermon good isn't that funny like i remember a kid one time who was sent to my church to listen to a sermon and write a report and he he said there was no sermon that day but a woman got up and talked about the bible and i thought that's so interesting he didn't even recognize what i did as a sermon cuz women don't preach right so at any rate back to baylor they did this survey and then they had to take a, a year and back up and try to decide what made a sermon good or effective i think they chose effective but the weekend that my name came out on that list um you know, for one day, it was just wonderful, Ryan. I mean, flowers arrived at the church and there was more mail that arrived than I could answer, you know, and it was almost the next day people started coming wanting selfies, you know, at the door. I don't think there were selfies then. there weren't cell phones then. Autographs. But it became awful. Yeah, it became, you know, very quickly after that, at least in my memory, some guy showed up in Bermuda shorts in this little church that seats 80 people. And when I got done preaching, he stood up and said, well, I don't know what was so great about that. And he left. Right. So it was just that sort of the the pedestal lasted 12 seconds. Um, the problem with fame or notoriety, my husband says I'm like badminton champion of the world. It's not a large thing and I should not let it go to my head, which is a helpful thing to remember me with my badminton trophy. Uh, but um, self-forgetfulness is key to, to my doing a good job at a lot of things. I prepare, I work hard. And then I forget myself. And and before I go on to speak, I forget myself. And I say, God, help me remember why I'm here. And I love these people. And I want to give everything I've got to them. And then I forget myself. But there's a way in which, what, being awarded or recognized interferes with self-forgetfulness a lot. You self-remember a bunch oh no, I just dropped a word. Oh, that hand gesture was in the wrong direction. I mean, this is partly my problem. You know, it's, it's kind of obsessive compulsive behavior, but um, self-forgetfulness is one of the reasons I don't have an easy time in church anymore. I can't really go into a church and sit and pray, you know, and, and maybe that's not what churches are for, but self-forgetfulness is vital to what we've been talking about, to flow, to mystical experience, to the the whole thing of being 
united with somebody else. You can't be remembering yourself too much, you know, when all that's going on. So that's that's what I would add in there is I am not on social media. I moved from Atlanta to a little town in Northeast Georgia with 1500 people. I live nine miles from that town. And and this is the kind of life that helps me live in self-forgetfulness that's highly creative to me and highly holy. Brilliant. What you just said tees off the next question perfectly because here's the struggle, right? It's like for those, and there are brilliant people, right? You're called to this spiritual conversation. You're called to talk about it. And people affirm that somehow when you're doing it, they're listening and it makes them think and it's beautiful. And all this thing gets lumped on you, but you walked away from it. And what you just said, I think is brilliant, like seriously brilliant, but it's like, do you think, because I'm tending to agree with you that that's the recipe. If you feel called to something, especially around spiritual power, you have to relinquish it or it will destroy you and destroy the message. And let's put our finger on what we have already spoken about. Let's leave this as being partly about my temperament, because I do know people who can step into the spotlight and they don't worry, you know, like I worry. So, so there are people who can manage that. I think there are people who call to it, you know, does, you know, does the Dalai Lama or Desmond Tutu or, you know, who are our heroes? Do, do, do they get to decide to move to a little town in Northeast Georgia? Thank God they don't. You know, but I but I do think it's upon us to be true to our temperament, to be true to the way we've been put together, because um, we're always part of a web of what's happening. I mean, even, you know, my moment in the spotlight as a woman preacher in what, 95, I think that was, there weren't that many women in the field. You know, I was part of a large web of, uh, I'm six feet tall almost, you know, I, there are a whole lot of other things going on than whatever preaching was about at that moment. But at any rate, I, I don't, I don't deliver formulas. I think I'm a terrible example of any, I'm a bad role model, but I do think I'm typical. I think I'm typical of a lot of things. So I'll go ahead and say stuff because I think I'm typical. Is, is there something about spiritual power though, that corrupts in a unique way that you've seen because the, the amount of scandals we can see in the church, big church pastors to get that authority, get that attention, whether it's sexual abuse, whether it's manipulative behavior, it makes me think that, I don't know, just having known that world, speaking purely from your experience, what is it about spiritual power that can sort of corrupt? Um, I'm going to call it isolation instead. I think power brings isolation with it. So I'd rather point the finger at the isolation because when people um, gather a, a great deal of power, unless they keep people around them, unless they stay in some kind of community with other people in their position, it becomes really hard to remember, to gauge, I don't know, to gauge themselves anymore. So that's where I see the scandal coming from is people got so isolated. I see clergy who get so isolated because of their roles. You know, their roles are so exalted that they finally don't feel like they can let much show that isn't exalted and that's isolating. Um, I could just go down a whole list of examples, but it's, it's the isolation the power causes that I identify as the problem. I'm thinking too, just, you said people can stay in it and there are people that are sort of called to it and able to handle it. But here's, here's just the thought. And I'd be curious to get your take on it. If you're really good at it and you stay in it long enough, they're going to make an idol out of you when you die. And these thoughts I've been having, right? Like, again, I, Richard Rohr is a big gateway spiritual yeah. dude for all the kind of stuff that would have, that is allowing us to speak today. Right. Um, yeah. But I'm very conscious, like when I'm telling people about things I learned through, like something that Richard might have said or something, I'm like, I don't like, I don't know, I, of course, it sounds silly, but you should never worship Richard. And he would be the first person, like, leave me alone. Like, he's, it's the Jesus thing. Like, he's steering it. Like, I'm not, it's not about me. But the problem <laughs> is the human nature is to build an idol around that. And it's almost like because he stayed ar around, so there's a canon of his books. There's a canon of his videos. You could build a religion around him like they did with Jesus, like they did with Muhammad. Like, and I'm not saying that Richard, that will happen or whatever, but you know what I'm trying to say? It just, it just made me think, and maybe you have no thoughts on it, but it's like maybe everyone, no matter what, even if they're handling it well, they risk being idolized after death. 
But that's almost the problem of the idolizers, isn't it? I mean, in a way, I mean, I'm glad you brought up Richard Rohr. Now, anybody who's listening to us who doesn't know who he is will look him up because he is the most self-effacing dude. He just will not let that happen. In fact, you probably heard him say that he praised God for one humiliation every day. I thought, you have to ask. I I don't have to ask. But, you know, he really does. He's just a wonderful model of how to serve in that role without inhaling you know, he just doesn't inhale it. So you and I should both make a list of people we admire who do that. And then you and I should also both refuse to become idolizers, Id- idolaters, That's because a, it's not mm, to us. You know, I see people mm. in airports and they're famous people and I just leave them alone. Do not go up and say, I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt you. Well, you just did interrupt them. And they were having a moment, you know, a quiet moment or a moment with their families or I'm just not going to be an idolater in that way as best I can help it. So I have a couple more quick questions. Is that okay? We have a few more yeah. minutes. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I I have to get into the area of, of darkness and suffering quickly with you because I know you've thought about this deeply. You've written about it and me and billions before me and billions after me have wrestled with this, this issue of darkness and suffering. Um, and I read in a quote, you talked about God and, and darkness being friends. And I know that's a big, and what do you mean by darkness? But just the philosophy and the theology that you've sort of maybe alluded to, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's the yin and the yang, right? It's the suffering and God and, and light. We shouldn't separate them. They could be one and the same. Is it too far to, to say you think God loves suffering, that God created suffering? I won't do that. I think God is in suffering, but I've had to... I've, my theology has led me to question human ideas of divine sovereignty, because when we go there, we make God responsible for babies born with half a heart. You know, I mean, a real literal pumping heart. I, we we make God responsible for COVID. We make God responsible for hurricanes. And so it's a very individual choice that I don't go there. I, I believe God is in all that happens. I, I the mystery of why things happen, I don't know. It seems to me that an awful lot of stuff happens because of us. You know, the old trope about asking God, where were you? And God says, where were you? You know, where were you when the Holocaust happened? Not where was I? Where were you when COVID happened? Um, so divine sovereignty, I'm very, I hover around it, but I'm, I don't go there like a lot of other people do. Now, let's separate darkness and suffering for a second, if we can. Because darkness is a metaphor gone rabid. You know, people right. tuck all kinds of stuff in the darkness folder that they that they haven't thought about too much. But I one example I often use is if I asked you to make a a, a timeline of your life with the highs and lows above. You know, you moved, you lost a parent, you lost somebody you loved, your beloved dog died, and below the line of what happened in your life give me a graph of your your spiritual life and it's just amazing how those lines meet you know where the suffering line comes down low the spiritual sensitiveness vulnerability comes up to meet it and that's an interesting line to me did somebody cause that i don't know but it is interesting to me that when i am suffering that thing about what we have most in common is our humanity that really becomes apparent, especially if I can remember I'm not the only one suffering right now, that whatever my state is, if I could just take a breath, I'd remember how many people have been there before me, are in it now, and will come after me. So I I call people to, to, to open up their darkness folder, look at what's in it, but also realize that first kisses and shooting stars and fireflies and dreams and incredibly beautiful things are in darkness because it's a place of uncertainty and you don't walk fast in the dark you walk slowly and all your senses are alive now i'm talking literal darkness but i think it's true of metaphorical darkness when i don't know where i'm going i seek companionship like no other time in my life i'm more open to any help i can get i am wide open for revelation you know so is that a bad thing i darkness and suffering uh there there's something there but i'm not going to seek suffering suffering will find me and i think too much of christian teaching Mm. tells us to go seek it and Mm. 
Mm -hmm. I don't think that's necessary. Jesus asked, so, he spared it. So here's an interesting question that I think you'll have some reflections on. I know it's a big question. I was asking a lot to unpack this, but your life and your life journey, I can relate in the sense that as you get older and experience thing, I've suffered. And as a result of that, I've seen more light. My friendships have gotten better. My purpose, my meaning in life has gotten better. So it's like, yes, what you just said makes sense to me. And then help me to think deeper or bigger or outside of myself on this. It's like, but I can look at other human experiences that objectively the suffering destroyed them, destroyed the light and they committed suicide. And we could talk about a 10 year old who did that at 15 and all the way up to hundred years old. How right. do you reconcile being like, I'm on this journey and look at this and this is great, but being like, but not everyone's on the same journey as me. And it seems to destroy right. them. How can I think? deeper about that or differently you know the only i actually got a answer from buddhist teaching on that you can let it break you open that you know that uh you can let that suffering that is not redeemed that that destroys people destroys people and destroys the people around them i just found out a beloved person in my community 45 years old probably took his life and there's no romanticizing or sentimentalizing that for, for anyone. Um, I often say the only people who talk about suffering, making us better people are people who survive it. You know, you only have a story if you come out, if you come out the other side. Um, if you've been depressed, it's a whole different thing to be. I mean, clinical bad stuff where you can't get out of bed. You can tell a story about it someday, but only if you live through it and only if it, you know, passes. So I, I don't have any kind of romanticism about suffering being a formula, a formula of, you know, X plus suffering equals better. You just use the word better. And then you use the word deeper. And those are two interesting things to me. Deeper, deeper I'll go. Better I'm not very interested in. Very interesting. Um, it, it, in a way, it kind of gives pause and makes me think, deeper about concepts of reincarnation, right? It's like, it's easier for me to reconcile that. I'm not saying I believe in that. And, you know, I'm, it's a, it's a beautiful thought experiment to be like, well, I'm the amalgamation of physically, I'm ancient material of stars and, you know, the whole conversation that's really trippy and stuff, but it's, it's true, objectively true from what we know about science. So that kind of alleviates a little bit of that, that there's, there has to be something after this. And maybe it's just a rebirth of some sort. I don't know if that sort mm -hmm. of, sort of Hindu kind of, um, stuff is worthwhile thinking about here. I'm pretty much a Christian existentialist. I'm not sure what that means. It sounds good, doesn't it? I hear, I hear yeah, story. Like, you know, oh, Kierkegaard was one. So I'm in other words, the here and now, maybe I'm a, maybe, maybe I've got holy envy for Judaism. You know, when I taught world religions, every tradition we studied had heaven and hell or afterlife except Judaism. And if you investigate that, you'll often hear it's because Torah the, the Hebrew Bible is about this life. It's about justice and it's about um, awe and it's about battle and it's about homeland and it's about generations and th that it's about this life, that, that God's teachings are about now and, and later is left very undefined, which I find true in the New Testament as well. But wow, I won't get into that argument <laughs> during this interview. So um I uh, I stick with here and now. And when people say, well, how do you conceive of the afterlife? That's where faith kicks in 100%. I don't have a clue, but I'm going. So I, I'm going to trust the universe is for me and not against me. And if that's true in this life, it may be true in some other. But I mean to live this life and not leave a drop in my cup if I can help it. Just another thought experiment I'm I'm curious on, and we touched on this before, you know, about holding on to sort of semantics and literalism and all these things. You know, if I was a betting person, we're probably going to be like, Earth might not exist soon. So the idea that Christianity, you know, you wrote before about like, you're from this tradition that's dwindling. Maybe that's good. If we lose the churches and lose the power, it's a quote of yours I found that was really nice. What if Christianity doesn't exist. There is a huge chance that no one's going to know what Christianity even means or who Jesus Christ was in a thousand years from now, 10,000 years from now. Does that bother you? Is that exciting to you? 
Um, how do you feel about the fact that, which seems wild to think, but likely it won't exist? Well, first of all, I think Earth will, we won't. It's us getting wiped out. It's not, I think, okay. you know, if you look okay. at the other planets in our system, they're bare, they don't support life, but they're still there. So we'll wipe ourselves out. Um, but I have some idea that'll continue. Well, let, I mean, what gave rise to Jesus Christ? What gave rise to creation? Will that not continue to be? I mean, look, at, all I would do is look at the, the web space telescope to know how much I don't know. I mean, have you ever just really laid down in the yard at night and looked up and thought, where does this end? I mean, the universe, what's where, how far does this go and what's beyond this? So whatever is enlivening you and me now will continue to enliven. I, that's my blind faith. So no earth, no humans, no Bible, no stories of Jesus. What gave rise to all that will give rise to something new. Um, and then, you know, you and I get to forget that we're, you know, it's all about us. That's beautiful. Just I'll, I'll wrap with this question. Just might sound a little silly, but you know, after sort of all these years of thinking and studying and suffering and celebrating, you know, is God really real? What doubts, if any, remain? Is God really real? Well, first of all, who would I be to know or to give you an authoritative answer? Whatever I call God, which is that enlivening spirit, talk to me when I'm on my deathbed, you know, talk to me when I can't lift a cup to my mouth and see if I say this, but I, I trust everything I have and am and have done to on the ongoing enlivening spirit that I call God. Other people will define that differently, but the, the power of love, the power of these experiences of union, you and I've been talking about this curiosity we've been talking about our conversation is my proof of God's existence. There you go, Ryan. This conversation is my proof. Who are you? Who am I? How did we connect? This is a great conversation. Where did this come from? What did we do to deserve this? You know, whatever this is, this is it. Don't make me cry at the end. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll end it there because it can't get better than that answer. And uh, I'll just say formally, thank you so much uh, for taking this time and for open for sharing like this and opening your heart like that. And you've inspired me and uh, a lot to chew on for myself and anyone who might find this now or a thousand years from now. So thank you so much. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome. I have loved every minute of it. And um, thank you. Thank you.